So last thing we did uh, last week was, <clears throat> sorry, we looked at the evolution of anthropogenic emissions over time using this useful little tool here at Gapminder, which you're welcome to explore yourselves. It contains a lot of data organized by country, region, and over time. Against a lot of stuff concerning emissions, growth, and poverty, and all that. What I want to look at today, we'll start off today at least, is the some of the classical perspectives on environment. To build a link with the stuff that you did with Sean Arian and classical theory in semester one, and also to lead us on to some of the later stuff, because we can't really, as I said, understand kind of the modern ideas, because modern ideas about environment are profoundly influenced by ideas of the past. And it's important that we see social theory as a cumulative process as well. New ideas build on old ones and old ideas undergo revivals and resurgences. And some, such as Marxism, have never really gone away. They've all they've always been there. And if we date the, the period in question, we're going to start ourselves off kind of in the 17th and 19th century during a period of um, intellectual development known as the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment is characterized by the emergence of a perspective that's often, as I said, referred to as techno-optimism or technological optimism. I referred to that in previous weeks, and this is the view that technology is the thing that is going to see us through, that the betterment of humanity is secured through the dominance of nature, the incorporation of resources or manipulation of resources for human needs. And it's very much an instrumental view of nature. Nature is a thing that is there to serve humans and in that sense that underpinning philosophy or logic is what drives or rationalizes legitimizes even not just the extraction of natural resources but as we saw in the section on colonialism the subjugation of entire populations to the will of colonial powers so it's about the application of reason during the phases of the agricultural and industrial revolutions we see the emergence of technology which again gives more impetus to the view or gives lends more support to the view that human domination is rational expected and the way forward. But over the course of the Enlightenment, we also see the emergence of a new branch of what would later come to be known as economic social science, but at the time was referred to as political economy. We still use the term political economy today to refer to <clears throat> uh, a subdiscipline of usually sociology that looks at the relationship between social and political systems and economic activity. So this phase of uh, this phase of growth and the, the new science of political economy, the study of human societies and economies is one that looks at predominantly the study of capitalist systems and free markets. But it also looks at institutions and the key institutions of the capitalist system are those of private property, which underpins private ownership which also underpins, again, the colonial logic that what we secure is ours, we own it, we also own the right to exploit it. And it also becomes part of the overall sort of apparatus that tries to understand these new trends and new phenomena associated with industrialization, such as the growth of cities, such as the decline of the countryside and the decline of agriculture. And then also we start to see profound changes in human habitation. We see urbanization, rural relocation. So especially in Britain, in the in the colonial and industrial powerhouses of the world but especially in Britain we start to see a mass exodus of individuals from agriculture from the country into cities and the new science of political economy um, in some part especially if we look at the work of people like Marx and Engels can be seen as an attempt to come to terms with the dislocation the change the upheaval that accompanies urbanization and industrialization and also the consequences for workers and the working class and it's at the tail end of this time that people like Durkheim begin to take an interest in this from the point of view of what they call what they call divisions of labor. So how humans in the in their time, at least the modern age, now live in an era of increasing specialization, where we're not living in sort of the times of the village craft industries anymore, where everybody's interdependent and they know each other. We're interdependent, but in a different way. We depend on the distant labor of others in cities to produce the food that we eat, the clothes that we wear. So Durkheim discusses social structure from that point of view of the division of labor and all the consequences that come along with that, that you would have studied with Sean in second year. But a number of other profound social upheavals are also taking place. The demographic, uh, democratic revolutions, the French revolution, the American revolution, and the rise of what we might refer to as modern popular government, so government elected by not through hereditary monarchies, but through popular suffrage. Again, Suffrage is denied to many individuals, especially women. It's the age of slavery as well, of course, in the Americas. Um, but over the course of the 18th and 19th centuries, we start to see 
the ending of slavery uh, in the Americas, spreading upwards from the Caribbean and then up towards uh, the United States in the later 19th century. Uh, the formal abolition of slavery, of course, segregation would continue and does continue to be a problem into the modern day. But there starts to emerge this view as well of the association between industry and democracy. So industry is seen as the basis for democracy because it's part of it's the center of what comes to finance these new emergent states. So American government in the 19 uh, in the 1800s, certainly 1900 and even in the present day is one that it grows up very much entwined with the interests of industry and capital. So capitalism through industry is seen as a key financier of the state. It's the entity that is taxed to provide public funds, along with individuals, of course. But we start to see this linking of the notion of democratic rights with property rights. And this is a very, very enduring issue. If we even look at if we if we if we look at Northern Ireland, let's say in the 1970s, uh, and we look at what was going on in Derry, let's say the question there around the election of local councillors. And again, one of the issues there, of course, was that was was the linking of voting rights to the holding of property. So it's a problematic idea that, you know, democratic rights or voting rights become linked with become linked with property. But also we start to see this emergence of kind of an idea or this sort of idealized legitimation of this idea of agricultural life, that agricultural life is something kind of ideal or virtuous or something some, or something to be valued. And this goes back to the, the theorist who we'll see in a moment, Rousseau, who talks a lot about sort of the nobility of agricultural life in the country. But ultimately, what we need to understand is that over this period, our ideas about how the environment works, how it's viewed and how it's valued change profoundly. We see the emergence of a very instrumentalist view of the environment. The environment is something that's there in service of the state, in service of society, in service of human needs. And it is underpinned by notions of private ownership. The environment is something that is carved up into pieces, is owned and that the owners enjoy autonomy in some regards, that they can do with it, they can do with it as they want. And in the science of political economy, there becomes an obsession with what we would call short termism and growth. So the question, the overwhelming social policy question, the overwhelming economic question becomes, how do we keep our economies in a constant state of growth to finance the state, to finance new ventures? And later on, as we go into the late 19th and early 20th centuries to finance the war efforts with the emergence of the First World War and the Second World War. So economics becomes concerned with short-termism, short-term growth. And this is important because this is a large part of the problem that we're in today is because of this obsession with short-term, with short-term returns to growth. In the wake of the COVID crisis, every policy drive globally was about getting people back to work, increasing productivity, getting economies growing again, moving again, despite the fact that what the evidence would say we should be doing is exactly the opposite. We should be moving away from growth. We should be slowing down over exploitation and production. So one of the first thinkers that we're going to look at is uh, Thomas Hobbes, who was writing around the time, writing around the time of the English Civil War. And Thomas Hobbes is one, if you don't anthropology, any anthropological theory classes, you'll be familiar with the work of Thomas Hobbes. And Hobbes is someone who takes a very pessimistic view of nature. He views nature, but more specifically, he views humans in their natural state, in the state of in the pre-state era. So when there were no governments, when there were no kind of big societies or civilizations, maybe as we would understand it. Hobbes takes this view that humans, without these things, without strong government uh, existing in a state of nature, they enjoy a relatively poor existence. He refers to it as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. That in the absence of security provided by a sovereign state that humans are really unable to secure or plan or engage in any forward planning for themselves. They can't engage in any sort of coordinated action for their own development. So property and the state become really important to Hobbes. He says, unless we have these things to take us out of the state of nature, uh, which is pretty nasty, then we're essentially doomed. And in part, what he's doing here is he's reacting to what he sees as the, the chaos of the the, 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 the chaos of the English Civil War and his, one of his solutions to this is that or one of his conclusions that he draws from this is that we need a strong sovereign we need a strong state and that needs to be underpinned by notions of private property that are policed and reinforced by the state so the idea of this natural state for Hobbes and this sort of pre-natural state excuse me a minute <coughs> is something that he comes to see as primitive uncivilized and backward this is in contrast to some of the thinkers that we look at in a moment. So what happens here is we start to see this alignment of 
the idea of the defence of the state, the centrality of the state and government, and in the case of England, the sovereign, the king or the queen, um, as being aligned with those of social and political values. So, in a sense, this notion of nature, this idea of this contrast of the state of nature, the primitive state of nature, with the state of modernity, of strong government, this is what enshrines for Hobbes um, these appropriate social and political values, that the state is something desirable to be defended. And it produces this very important binary and dichotomy that sees the state of nature as something negative. So humans in their natural state, it says, are not really, it's not anything to be desired, that actually security and human flourishing is best secured or best guaranteed by a system of private property underpinned by strong government and a strong king. Writing a little bit later, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, writing partly, I suppose, in reaction or in, not necessarily directly, but in dialogue with the ideas of Hobbes, is discussing the origins of inequality. And in the origins of inequality, what Rousseau starts to do is engage in this critique or discussion of Hobbes's depiction of the state of nature. And Hobbes takes a very, very different view of this. Hobbes' view of the state of nature is one that's, is one that's profoundly positive. Uh, sorry, Rousseau's view of the state of nature is one that's positive. Rousseau is often associated with um, this idea of the noble savage, the idea of that would later become kind of predominant in, in early US politics of the kind of the nobility of agricultural life or the nobility or, um, of the countryside um, as a way of living and a way of existence. So Rousseau points out that indeed, although private property might be the foundation of civilization, it might be an important component in human flourishing, the problem is that it's also based on very strong and profound differences in power and class that themselves have meaningful consequences for, for human life and human flourishing. And in other words, private property might be a precondition of civilization, but it also brings with it other effects, other side effects, which are imbalances of power, concentrations of power in the hands of the few, and also class differences, so stratification, social stratification. <coughs> So Rousseau really questions this idea of civilization as an advanced evolutionary state. In the view of Hobbes, there's a very, very clear evolutionary narrative there that humanity in a state of civilization, in a state of government, is this is the evolved form. This is the higher form, the highest form. And Rousseau begins to question this by saying that, well, if this were true, then why do we have all of these existing and persistent imbalances of power and class differences? He also notes, kind of prefiguring in a way what Durkheim would later talk about through uh, through the concept of anime, the idea that actually what happens in what happened, one of the consequences of modern civilization is this process of alienation, that humans actually become estranged from estranged from the natural conditions of their own existence. And we look at this in the modern age, the way that Marx would have talked about something like the metabolic rift or Durkheim would have talked about anime. This is like one of the consequences for Rousseau is what happens when you take humans out of this natural context where they have a visible appreciation for where their food comes from, where their waste goes, where their water comes from. So it's a critique of inequality as a cost of evolution, because for Hobbes, this progress is positive. The, un the institutions of private property are positive, despite these externalities of inequalities of power and class. So power and class imbalances for Hobbes are a necessary evil to keep us out of the state of nature. But Rousseau questions this and says that actually, well, if we look at actually existing inequality, is this if this is the price of civilization, then can we really say that we are that we are evolved? Um, so for Hobbes, what he, or for Rousseau, sorry, my mind's a bit fuzzy today, by the way, I didn't sleep very much. This idea of a cooperative social order that might, in a sense, mirror what Hobbes would have talked about as a primitive state might be more desirable from a human point of view. So he inverts this idea of the negativity, the idea that human dominance is something to be celebrated by saying, well, look at, all, look at what we've done. Look where this has got us. Civilization has got us to this point. Yes, it's great. We've got industry. We've got advances in technology. But we also have persistent inequality. So maybe we need to revise or rethink this idea of the binary of nature bad, civilization good. And writing a little bit later, just before... And now, Malthus is an important figure historically because um, in his earlier writings, Marx engages quite clearly with um, and quite closely with the works of Thomas Malthus. But Malthus's ideas are enduringly important to this very day. And we'll see this later on with examples of statements from politicians and media and, and that Malthus's ideas are, are prominent today. They're very prominent and they're given a lot of currency. And it's important that we understand where and where they came from and why in order to engage in a critique of that. 
So in the works of Malthus, um, the principal works of the principles of population, Malthus suggests that equating this idea of social progress and equality is undesirable because he suggests it's impossible on natural grounds that we cannot have progress without the side effects or the consequences of inequality uh, and all that it tends with. <clears throat> but Malthus refers to this, points this out specifically with regard to production, to the production of food. And his argument is that there's an inevitable, sort of, there's an inevitable contradiction that exists within human societies. And that if we look at the rate of growth of population and we look at the rate of growth of food production and we overlay these, that actually because they develop at different rates, and I'll show you a graph that illustrates this in a moment, they're fundamentally incompatible. And what Malthus is doing, he's, he, he, he's engaging at the time of the, particularly in the early 1830s, um, what we're starting to see emerging in England is... Um, what 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 we might call the putative or the early measures that would later form the basis of the welfare state, so things like the poor law inquiries, uh, the foundation or the founding of poor law guardians and unions and things like that. So states, uh, England are starting to experiment with what would later become uh, what what were at the time social welfare measures, measures that would later become the basis of the modern welfare state. And Malthus is engaging in a critique with this because he's saying that to provide welfare to the poor is undesirable because all that's going to do is incentivize reproduction. Right. The problem for Malthus is that food supply is unable to match population growth. And at the time population is growing, especially in Ireland, the population is going from 4 million to 8 million over a very, very short period of time. <coughs> and the latter argument then is that it's also undesirable because it will be a motivator to unemployment. Why would somebody want to work if they're able to access social welfare? And hopefully you can see that this is an idea that continues Versus 200 years later, we're still thinking, some people at least are thinking in the same frame of mind. It's an, it's an influential and an enduring mode of thinking. So what Malthus's work is about really is about the application of this scientific understanding of the laws of human reproduction, natural reproduction, um, and to see what those consequences are when those two are overlaid onto each other. So Malthus is most associated with the theory of Malthusian catastrophe, which is this little sort of point here. Uh, any questions at this point? No, we don't. Which is this point here. So on the multi on the graph, on the Malthusian growth model, we have two axes. We've got the vertical, the y-axis, which is quantity. So this is number of people. This is quantity of food. And over here, we have time. So if you can imagine, let's say, hypothetically, this first data point is the 1700s. This latter data point is, let's say, the 1850s. What you've got here is time. Now, the argument that Malthus makes is that the rate of growth of human population is exponential right it's in this curve so it's non-linear right the growth rate increases and past a particular point it becomes steeper and steeper whereas food production is arithmetic it's linear right food production can only be increased on a linear on a linear basis so what happens then is as and again this is an idealized model this is not based on real real world data this is a theoretical model over time the human population growth rate continues increases to a point where it outstrips that of food production and the fundamental incompatibility for Malthus is that if human population is allowed to grow unchecked, it will eventually surpass our capacity to grow food. So population continues to grow, but the food production that could sustain that particular level of population can only grow at this rate. So at this point here, we enter into what's known as a Malthusian catastrophe. And we'll see later on in later weeks that for a long time, this was one of the predominant theories of famine was what we call the food availability decline model which said that famines occur because there's an outstripping of food supply uh, with demand, or there's too many people for too little food, which we'll criticise later on, which is not, not which is not strictly the case. Um, the majority of famines there is, on a global scale at least, or local scale, adequate food supply. It's a question of distribution. So what Malthus is doing here is he's using or he's marshalling what he sees as these natural laws of reproduction as an argument against human welfare. But it's also an illustration of what he believes the ecological consequences of population growth are going to be. And this will continue later on, all through the 20th century, we'll see publications like uh, Paul Ehrlich's The Population Bomb, uh, like the Club of Rome's publication, The Limits to Growth, which all of them, all of which talk about the population problem, the need to reduce population growth. And a lot of this is based on a somewhat outdated Malthusian and a projection logic that looks at this basic incompatibility between food supply and population. And then, we also have, finally, we'll look at someone from the later 19th century, Herbert Spencer, 
again, Spencer being a precursor to Durkheim, who was also associated with what might be referred to as the functionalist way of thinking or the functionalist mode of thought. Now, you would have covered this with Sean in second in uh, in semester one of your second year, um, where he would have talked about sort of the ideas of Durkheim as functionalist, this idea of looking at society as kind of analogous to the human body, where all the parts work interdependently and you have to look at it as a functional as a functional whole. Herbert Spencer is one of the first or was one of the first to apply evolutionary ideas to human behavior. Um, but also to kind of take it a little bit further by saying that, yes, although we can look at sort of humans as an evolutionary state advanced from that of primates, humans are not just like animals, we are animals. And by extension, what this allows Spencer to do then is to transplant the laws of natural behavior, animal behavior onto, onto human behavior. And again, we see traces and remnants of this uh, today in the work of certain modern philosophers to talk about to talk about naturalistic tendencies or, you know, the natural basis of things like gender and so on. Long, or in many respects, long, long discredited. And what he talks about is the adaptive mechanism. For Spencer, adaptation is important. The idea of competitive advantage. So just as we find, just as Darwin found in the biological world, but those who are best adapted to survive and pass on their advantageous characteristics were those most likely to survive and reproduce. He also transplants this idea onto human societies. So really what he's doing is he's applying this continuity of humanity and nature, seeing humans and nature, humanity and animals as existing on kind of the same, the same, the same continuum. Now, this to us sounds like a very conservative idea today, but at the time it was actually quite radical. And again, mirroring the work of Darwin, Darwin's work was controversial too because it challenged the hierarchically religious view, especially the Judeo-Christian view of humans as dominant. If we look at sort of the biblical readings of nature and humanity, the dominant reading of humanity is one of superiority. Humans are separate from, superior over nature. The human world is dominant over the natural world. And if we look at Judaism, Christianity, um, Islam as well, of course, all of which are very strong and clear prescriptions, um, dietary guidelines about what we can, what we should and should not eat, which are reflective of this philosophical worldview of human dominance. So for Spencer to say that actually really there's no distinction here, that we're all we're all in the same, that we're all subject to the same natural laws, we're on the same continuum, uh, of its time is quite a radical idea. So in terms of reading off society then, what Spencer is doing is he's saying that, well, yes, society is simply an organism. Human societies can be looked at as an organism, just like any other natural organism, like a cell, like an organ, like a species, with the same applicable laws. <clears throat> And that really human development is driven by evolutionary evolutionary logics, just at a different scale, at a different level. The problem then is kind of, if we go back to what Malthus had to say in the previous slide about welfare, is that it produces a very pessimistic view of human welfare, that actually we're doing damage if we try to help the less well-off, the less advantageous, because we're stunting social evolution. Again, if development is driven by evolutionary progress based on natural selection, competitive advantage, then to interfere in that, to elevate the less advantageous, advantageous is not desirable because we're in, we're interfering in this mechanism, the adaptive mechanism, right? Because if we're elevating people who are less advantageously placed, then in a sense we're doing harm to human evolution overall. That's the view that we get from from Spencer. We often refer to this as social Darwinism, and social Darwinism is this idea that we should have low levels of interference, right? That humanity is driven by natural laws. We shouldn't interfere in those laws because. Humans are no different to animals. We are both driven by ruthless competitive advantage and that those best placed to survive ultimately will. You can see how this logic becomes very wholesale transplanted onto things like the business world that, you know, we should have. You know, and this kind of underpins the logic of why we should have light touch regulation for businesses and capital as well, that they should be allowed to compete for each other, that businesses should be allowed to go to the wall if they're not competitive. And that's fine. So in terms of human economic activity, then what it does, what this over, what this underpinning narrative does is it justifies this idea of nature as red in tooth and claw. It's also equally applicable to human society and human economic activity. It also points to us and suggests to us that actually inequality is not a bad thing, right? In the Spencerian view, in the social Darwinist view, inequality is totally fine. In fact, inequality is desirable. Inequality is a sign that the competitive mechanism is working, that those who are best placed are able to elevate themselves to the top. What that means is, by extension, the framework, if you like, the, the ideal framework we should be providing at a, at, at a state level or a government level is one that keeps the free market going, that reduces rules on um, that reduces rules on human economic behavior and allows that evolutionary competitive mechanism 
to, uh, to advance. But it also closes off avenues for change. Because in a sense, if capitalism is simply natural, if, if it's merely a reflection of humanity's natural tendencies, then there's nothing we can do about it. We can't fix inequality. There's no point trying because if it's part of human nature, human character, then what's the point? More to the point, even if it's desirable, if it's an indication that natural selection is working as it should, why would we bother doing things like implementing social welfare programs? You can see again what the consequences of the Darwinist view would be in terms of environmental destruction. The environment is not even factored in this. Right, the environment is an instrument in this competitive competitive advantage, this competitive process. The problem, of course, is that as sociologists, we know that there's nothing sort of natural about what's going on here. The people who are in the most powerful positions are there through, as we saw last week, processes of primitive accumulation because they're able to monopolize things like the colonization process because, as Marx would have said, their history, the history of primitive accumulation, how individuals come to accumulate advantage, capital, money, is usually written in violence and underpinned by violence. So evolution is not something that depends simply on sort of this naked aggression. We find that actually those who are able to rise to the top are able to do so by processes that are usually to the disadvantage of other people. So evolution, we'll also see in a moment, is also assisted. <clears throat> the idea that evolution is something that just occurs in a vacuum on its own, that human advancement can only happen under conditions of pure competition, is also not true. Because, as we'll see in the next slide, the next section, in the work of Eleanor Ostrom, that actually cooperation is one of the, is a key evolutionary mechanism as well. I don't like using the term evolution, but anyway. Incidentally, it wasn't Darwin that used the term survival of the fittest. It was, it, it was, um, it was Spencer when, when he was discussing, um, discussing human government. Uh, a couple of years ago, about two years ago at this point, this guy, Andrew Sabinsky, was appointed as an advisor to Boris Johnson. And... During his tenure as UK Prime Minister, Johnson underwent a recruitment drive. Uh, it was kind of an open call thing where he was looking for kind of disruptive people to apply who had radical ideas and they'd be given a point and they'd be given a say or an input into 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 public policy. And these are some quotes. And again, it's OK. It's it's one thing to single out individuals. But as I always say, it's important to recognize that the individual draws their ideas from a well of a well of opinion, that it's not just one person. The first quote says there are excellent reasons to think the very real racial differences in intelligence are significantly genetic in origin, though the degree, of course, is a very serious subject of scholarly debate. Uh, that debate bustles busily on, and I'm sure we'll have more precise answers in another five years or so. The short answer there, of course, is no, we won't. We've been studying this stuff for years. It's got no basis whatsoever. The whether the politicians will pay any attention is debatable. Second quote is, one way to get around the problems of unplanned pregnancies, creating a permanent underclass, would be to legally enforce universal uptake of long-term contraception at the onset of puberty. 99% of the time, of course, these people are talking about contraception for women, uh, not for men, or to cede the control of that with women, not men. Vaccination laws give it a precedent, I would argue. And what we see here is a very, very sort of clear Malthusian logic, which is that the, po the problem is population. And also by implication, if we draw sort of from the initial sort of wellspring of Malthus's ideas, that it's not population necessarily, it's the reproduction of the poor. So from Malthus, we get this idea that population is the problem, but it's the poor reproducing that's the problem. And from Spencer, we get the idea that under this assumption of competitive advantage, survival of the fittest, then it's fine for the wealthy to reproduce. It's fine for the top, the, the top of society to reproduce, but it's not OK for the poor to reproduce. So we get this very sort of classist, sexist, racist narrative um, when we locate this within the level of population. It's important from an ecological point of view as well, because it's something that's going to underpin later on, as we see a lot of the modern ideas about what the solution to the ecological crisis is, because we're still still talking about population. We're still talking about population growth without criticizing or interrogating the ideas underpinning it, the evidence that population control would work. Um, but also what the consequences of population control are, because we know from historical evidence, when we talk about population control, we're talking about control for the poorest, not for the richest. So there's all of these consequences that come along with it. For all these terms, <coughs> I've included a slide, which is like a kind of a glossary of terms, if you want to go back through them. Uh, any questions at this point? Uh, you're welcome to kind of jump in at any point if you want, but if there's anything you want to put in the chat as well, uh, please feel free to do so before we start on the next section. 
money we got today. Eleven, that's not too bad. <clears throat> I'll check back to this in a moment. So we should have brought some water. I think my voice is gone. Uh, so that brings us to where we're at today, which is uh, the topic of commons and common pool resource systems. This section is probably the most difficult of the course. It gets a bit easier after this, I think, um, because there's some kind of theoretical stuff that we need to work, work through a little bit in this. But it's worth it because the notion of commons, common pool systems, it's a very current debate, I think, in environmental sociology, and it's something that we do need that we do need to understand. <clears throat> Any questions? No. Okay, I'll continue on then. Hope you're all hanging in okay. <clears throat> so the title of this section is The Tragedy of the Commons and the Free Rider Paradox. And the question that we want to raise in this section or the questions that we want to raise in this section are questions that continue to influence human resource management, natural resource management to this day. Questions like what is the best way to manage resources and environment and the environmental consequences of human action? In other words, what is the best way? What sort of society would we be looking at if we were if we think about sustainability as an outcome that involves a particular type of government, let's say, what would that government look like? Or if we think about this at the level of communities, let's say people, towns, villages, settlements, what would that actually look like? How would people organize themselves in a way that would ensure sustainability? Do we need things like central authorities? Do we need strong rules, regulations, fines and taxes? Is that the only way? The way that we're accustomed to thinking about sustainability now is through sort of through through kind of a punitive framework that we can only have sustainability if we have monitoring systems that punish people strongly enough for breaking the rules. So if we look at things like the Environmental Protection Agency, let's say, as a central authority that's charged with you know, the oversight of environmental quality and conditions. Or we look at something like, you know, Chagask or peripheral agencies like Antashka that have oversight of some aspects of planning. What we're asking there, the questions we're asking there is, is this the best way of doing things where we have these like central agencies, these big agencies that are empowered to oversee police and define who should arbitrate or who should decide? Who gets to decide what sustainable is? Who gets to decide what sustainable behavior is? Um, if a local farmer decides to, you know, set up a wetlands, let's say, on their own land, you know, should it be something that's licensed, authorized? Should there be a monitoring agency? Should there be oversight for compliance? All these types of things. The question that interested people like the people we're going to look at now, uh, which are Garrett Harden and Eleanor Ostrom, are questions such as whether humans are doomed to ruin and conflict without strong governance. This question of whether, unless humans have a firm hand to direct and enforce laws, punishments, behaviours, boundaries, and that, are we ultimately doomed that we'll simply, you know, outcompete each other, we'll overexploit, unless there's oversight and unless there's government, unless there's rules, unless there's punishment. Another question we might ask is whether there's another way. Is it possible that we could cooperate in our collective self-interest? In other words, if people were left to their own devices, let's say, is there a way in which people could form, let's say, their own collectives that would act in their own self-interest in an ecologically sustainable way? The question we want to pose in this section is that, do humans need inevitably need strong government? Do they need rules? Do they need taxation? Or is there another way of doing things? Is there a different way of doing things? So the concept that we're looking at today is the notion of the commons. And these are examples of different types of commons. Commons or common pool resources are aspects of the natural world, or indeed the social world in some cases, that are not owned by any one individual. Individuals might have rights to access them, to use them, to exploit them, but they don't necessarily have what we would understand as fixed property rights or ownership. From this point of view, we can look at oceans and fisheries as a commons. Okay, now, we know that oceans are subject to boundaries. We have fishing zones, we have territorial waters. There are always boundary disputes um, about fishing and about the encroachment of outside fishing vessels, which we'll look at in a second. In a sense, fisheries are commons to the extent that we can't really put a fence around fishing, so we can't put fences around the ocean and say, this part is ours, we fish that, or whatever. And fish stocks, in many respects, are free to move around as they wish. It, it, it can't be bounded and it can't be controlled. 
similar to this one here, like a grazing commons. I think it's somewhere like the Curra in County Kildare today, where and commons, common grazing, <coughs> which is something that still exists in many parts of the world today, are um, basically large tracts of land that are not owned by any one individual. There might be common rights might be attached to, let's say, a village or to a town where people who live and farm in that town have access or the rights to graze animals in the commons. But the commons exists in this sort of liminal space where it's neither it's not necessarily the property of the state, nor is it the property of any individual or group of individuals in the town. An example from Ireland would be something like bogs. Again, bogs can be seen as a common resource and bogs are a controversial issue at the moment because one of the things that we've been trying to do for the last two years is to regulate uh, household level turf cutting out of existence. Household turf cutting is important, especially in areas of the west of Ireland, northwest of Ireland, Donegal and that, um, as a source of fuel. Fuel poverty is a really big issue in rural areas. And again, of course, we saw it this year with rising energy prices. The people often can't afford to fuel their homes using commercial outlets like gas and oil, kerosene and stuff like that. So in areas that do have access to bog, uh, they're an important subsidiary. They're an important contributory source of fuel um, for heating, for cooking and for stuff like that. As we'll see in later years, if we look at um, countries in the global south, many of those countries are completely excluded from the fossil fuel industry. Fuels are things like harvested wood. So they're not actually. And this is an important issue when we get to looking at the inequalities of emissions. You know, who is responsible for world emissions? Actually, quite a considerable proportion of humanity does not engage at all in fossil fuel exploitation. They're using kind of um, fuels that are aside from like fossil fuels and peats. They're using woods and things. So these are examples of commons. There are resources that can't be bounded, that are not subject to what we would understand as normal property rights. And if you think of what the normal is, if you think of a farm, right? if you think of a farm in Ireland, a farm we understand as, you know, as, as a piece of land that has boundaries around it. It's got hedges. Farmers know who owns what. They know where their piece of land is. There's a house in the middle and they own and they farm just that piece. They have rights of exclusion. They can stop people from encroaching on their land within particular environmental regulatory limits. They can do what they want on that land. And that's what we would understand as a private property or a private resource system. Commons are different in that we can't enforce these rights of exclusion. Many, many different people have access to the resource. <coughs> Any questions at this point? No, we're good. But the commons for a very the notion of commonage or commons for a very very long time was seen as a problem. In well, nineteen sixty eight, Harden Garrett Harden, biologist, writes this very famous ecologist. Sorry, writes this very famous essay where he raises what he calls uh, the concept of the tragedy of the commons. And in this quote from the paper in sixty eight, he says, "Therein is the tragedy." Each man is locked into a system that compels him to increase his herd without limit. In a world that is limited, ruin is the destination toward which all men rush, each pursuing his own best interest in a society that believes in the freedom of the commons. Later on, he would also make another comment, which was that freedom to breed will bring ruin to all. And ultimately what Hardin is saying that in any instance where we have a common resource, they're doomed to fail. The problem here is it's based on an assumption of how humans behave. According to Hardin, what's going to happen is because every individual is compelled, right? every individual is driven by what he calls a rational strategy. And the individual rational strategy is to maximize your individual gain. So he says, if you consider a situation where, let's say two people hypothetically are competing over, let's say a grazing ground, their individual incentive is going to be to stock as many as they can on the grazing ground. Right, because if they don't do it, the other person might overstock it. They'll reap the advantage of it, whereas the other person won't. The land will be exhausted and they get punished even further because now they can't graze anymore. What Hardin is pointing out or claiming is that unless we have regulation, unless we have strong government, strong enforcement of private property rights, then humans are going to simply work any resource to exhaustion. It's very tempting to think of that, to think of that as okay, because when we look at what's happening today with fossil fuel extraction, and we see that even, you know, even in the presence of regulation, we're working those to exhaustion, we're over extracting. So why would that not be? Why, why would this not be true? Part of the problem lies in the assumptions. So ultimately, what comes from this, the suggestion from Hardin is there's a number of things. First of all, unless we have private property, and this is a very kind of Hobbesian perspective, so unless we have private property, a strong state, strong punishments for those who break the rules, then we're doomed to ruin. <coughs> the people on an individual or even a small scale collective level 
cannot be trusted to operate resources in their own interest. But by extension, then, what he's also pointing towards is the notion of population. Population control is central to this, unless we have strict regulation, strict regulation of resources. And oftentimes that's not just about imposing rules about what people can and can't do on their land. It's about restricting the overall numbers of people who can potentially exploit that land through population control. That, according to Hardin, strict regulation is the only way to halt an impending global tragedy. Unless we slow down population growth, that's it. Unless we enforce strong rules and strong regulations, then that's it. You might be familiar with this logic from uh, what's often referred to as the free rider paradox. The free rider paradox claims that one who cannot be excluded from the benefits of a collective good has no incentive to contribute to the provision of that good. Um, if you've ever done group work, uh, this is not the reason I don't assign group work. I don't assign group work because I just hate it at a personal level. But if you've ever done group work, and I'm not suggesting this is universal, but people often complain that they find themselves in a situation where you have a group of four, uh, maybe two people are doing some of the work, three people are doing the work, and one person isn't. This is an example of what we might call the free rider paradox. Okay, the person in the group, because of, if, I, if, if I was to set up an assessment right, that said, okay, the four of you submit a project together, and each one, you, all, you all get the same mark. right? So there's one assignment, you all contribute to it, you all get a 70. The free rider paradox then emerges because you can't exclude anyone from the benefits of the collective good, right? The collective good is the assignment. Three of you produce the assignment, but because of the way I've set it up, the fourth person also gets the grade as well. But Hardin takes this a bit further and he says that, well, it's actually because of the way this is set up that actually that person has no incentive in the first place to actually contribute to it. <coughs> and the logic is that if I set up an assignment in that way, if I set it up that everybody gets the 70, that the person who is so inclined will have no incentive to contribute to the provision of the good, right? So he's saying that, why wouldn't you? It's rational. You would simply just opt out or decide not to work. Now, the very fact that three people do, of course, belies the myth of the free rider paradox, because people generally are, generally are interested. But if we apply this to ecological resources, if we, if we, if we apply this to the environment, what Hardin is talking about here is, if you consider anything like a farming system, a forest system, a fishery, um, anything like that, one person may free ride on the efforts of others without exclusion from its benefit. So in other words, unless there is unless there's a system of regulation and exclusion set up, then what's the what's the source of motivation? If you think about this in a different way, right? If you think about let's say there's a forest or there let's imagine that there's a grazing system, and we'll look at a schematic example of this in a moment. And there's two herders, right? So we have four acres of grazing ground that's not any one prop any one individual's property, but there are two people who want to graze that. The problem Hardin says is that because that ground is undivided, right, if we simply split it in two, we give one person half, the other person half, then we solve the problem because now that person, because the other person is not going to do any work on their portion of the ground, then they're now incentivized to maintain it. He would say if we have the opposite situation where everything is simply in common, then someone will be incentivized not to contribute to its maintenance. They'll simply say, oh, the other person is going to do it, so why should I? The problem is that it's not a zero-sum game. Or if everyone decides not to do anything, consider the coursework example. If one person decides not to, that's not really a problem. If two people decide not to, it's annoying, but then two people might be able to complete. If everybody chooses to free ride, or if nobody decides to do the assignment, then nobody gets the grade. So the benefit can't be produced. So there is a limiting logic to this as well, right? It's not the case that everybody, you know, by default is going to drop off and simply stop maintaining something just because other people are around. We know people don't work that way. But ultimately, what Hardin is saying is that if everyone chooses to free ride, then the resource simply goes to ruin or it's not produced. Or occasionally, some free riding may lead to suboptimal delivery of the benefit. So in the case of the coursework, if four people are working on it versus two people versus three people, the argument is that you get a better product at the end of it than you would have if simply one or two people had worked on it. <coughs> so this argument goes for natural resources as well, according to Hardin. The free rider paradox introduces this problem where Either nobody, everybody might decide you know, simply to opt out because nobody can be excluded from its benefits. Or if one or more individuals free ride on it, then the resource will not be optimally maintained because their labor isn't being put into it and it's not being maintained. In 1965, Manker Olson, the economist, said that unless the number of individuals is quite small or unless there is coercion or some other special device to make the individuals act in their common interest, Rational, self-interested individuals will not act to achieve their common or group interests. 
And this is the underpinning logic of the state, if you like, the role of the state in this. That unless we have private property, unless we have a strong state to enforce those rules, to coerce them. And again, private property is coercive because if the resource, if the grazing ground is privatized, then that becomes coercive in itself. The individual is now coerced to maintain it. But ultimately, what I'm trying to communicate to you is that in the 19th, and even still to this day, that based on this presumption of the tragedy of the commons, emerged this dominant view that unless we have rigorously enforced private property rights, then we're in serious trouble. Now, the side effect of this, of course, is that this brings with it all kinds of inequalities. We know that if we look at, say, how resources are managed today on a private property system, we know that in the main, a lot of them are organized through monopolies global fruit production, global grain production, coffee production, uh, fossil fuel extraction and things like that are increasingly managed and food production, uh, food supply is managed by an increasingly small number of companies who pool their interests, who are able to accumulate over time and leverage uh, leverage that rose to buy out smaller players and smaller competitors. And overall, that's not good either, because when we're in now that we're in that monopoly situation, a lot of these people are able to escape the regulatory rules that were designed to keep them in check in the first place. Even worse, they're now able to shape the rules and the policies in their own interest. They are, they are, corporations are powerful interests who can shape their own rules, shape their own conditions of exploitation. So this is the problem we're confronted with. The problem, on the one hand, is that Harden is saying that, you know, in this state of sort of natural cooperation, if we leave people alone to manage things, to manage their own local resources on their own, we're in serious trouble because of this collective action problem, because of the tragedy of the commons. And then according to economists like Olson, unless we have this coercion, through private property, we're also in trouble because nobody is going to be incentivized to manage their common interests. What I want to do in the next section is challenge this logic a little bit and to say that actually this presumption, this assumption is not compatible with historical evidence. If we look historically, we see many, many cases where humans have managed resources in common without a strong state, without strong regulations and laws in a very, very sustainable manner. And that actually this might provide us perhaps with an alternative model for how we might manage our resources today. So I'll finish there. It's just coming up on 5-2 and I'm going to take a break for an hour because my voice is killing me. So thanks for your time and I'll see you back here in an hour.